And I should also say my claim to fame, as I guess was expressed in the previous panel, is that I, you know, uh, was a professor of uh, Ruth uh, Greenwood there, and um, uh, as well as performed her wedding to her husband. So um, that's actually got me in trouble uh, in certain redistricting litigation, but but hopefully this, uh, I don't know, is this appearing on the web? It probably is. Right? So, um, but if, if it's any consolation, I've hated her ever since. So, so uh, I'm going to, my current work, I, I I'm, have moved out of, I shouldn't say out of, because of my work in dealing with the law of democracy, I've moved into um, examining how the internet is affecting democracy. And it came, most people's reaction to the Citizens United decision was that they looked at it as a situation in which uh, the court was granting individual personhood rights to corporations, that, um, you know, that it was corrupting the First Amendment by um, uh, basically saying that corporate, unlimited spending by corporations could uh, overwhelm the process. I looked at that case a little bit differently. Most people don't realize that what Citizens United was about was a uh, movie that was put on demand, on demand programming like you know HBO on demand by a admittedly a, a corporation, uh, nonprofit corporation. It was a hit job on Hillary Clinton to be sure. Although I have to say, in today's politics, it looks quite tame uh, by comparison. This was in the 2008 primary that was put up, but because. This movie was uh, funded by corporate money and then um, was produced and, and, and potentially aired in 30 days before the primary election in 2008 where she was going against uh, then later President Barack Obama. Uh, it was captured by the relevant statute at the time, right? the McCain-Feingold law. And you know the rest of the story, but what was interesting is that at the Supreme Court and in the opinion, there is some discussion about well, if you could ban this movie, which is put on demand, well, uh, that's funded by a corporation, right? Uh, uh, um, even if a nonprofit corporation, could you ban Hillary the book, right? Could you ban Hillary the book? Well, and the, the solicitor, acting solicitor general kind of dances around and says, this isn't a case about books, it's about this movie. It's like, it's like yeah, yeah, we know what, it's what the court says. Uh, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts says, I understand, but what's the government's position? If the First Amendment allows you to ban a movie that's placed on demand, could you ban a book? And he tries again to, to sort of dance around, and, and Justice Kennedy tries, and he says, what about that Kindle thing? Literally, that's the question if you look in the Supreme Court. <laughs> what about that? That's kind of a book, but then again, it's kind of a satellite communication, and that's covered by the statute, right? What do we do with that? Could you ban, if you have this book that comes on that Kindle thing, could the, is it the government's theory that that could be banned consistent with the First Amendment? Again, he says, look, this isn't about Kindle things either, right? But, and then Chief Justice Roberts sort of slams his hand on the podium and says, what's the government's theory? We understand what the statute is not, but if you could ban Hillary the movie, could you ban a book that was produced under the same circumstances? And the lawyer for the government says yes. And there's an audible intake of air in the Supreme Court building. And which, when I teach First Amendment law to my students, whatever you learn in this class, I say, if you're arguing for the Supreme Court, try not to be on the side of book banning, right? Because it, the rest is history, right? And, 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 but, but that's usually not the, the thing that people remember about the case, right? Uh, because it's focusing on corporate money and the like. Um, but it did raise the question as to how our theories of free speech, theories of campaign finance, our, our questions about the democracy and, and influence on the democracy are contingent on the ways that people are communicating and the technologies that they're using, okay? And so this movie, right, because it was downloadable, right, led to all kinds of questions about uh, the effect of the internet on uh, campaigns. Now, as, as uh, Ed was just talking about, we were living even at that time in a, uh, uh, during a period when at least the way that people thought about the impact of the internet on democracy was more utopian, that it was, you know, if you think about the way we thought about micro-targeting in the 2008 election, it was like, look at these Jedi masters working for the Obama uh, campaign and how they were so skilled in targeting voters and the like, right? It wasn't um, the current narrative. Uh, it could liberate people by, by sort of having a new campaign playbook that fo focused on small donor fundraising. Um, and the end of television advertising, right, or the replacement by, by something else could... Um, 
right, could enable a whole new crop of candidates to uh, have power. And that is true. And I want to be clear, even though this is a can, the demo can democracy survive the internet kind of talk, um, there is, the internet is a technology like any other. There are good, it has great potential and it has evil potential, right? And, and just because we're living through the dark times right now does not mean that the upside is not either being realized in, in certain circumstances right now or even over the long term. But of course the narrative has changed, right? So after the 2016 election, now when we think about the internet and democracy, we think about things like fake news, Twitter bots, foreign hacking, uh, dark posts and the like, right? And so I'll talk a little bit about um, um, the individual stuff. I am, I am currently leading this effort called Social Science One, you can Google it, which is trying to make uh, Facebook data available to social scientists around the world to examine Facebook's impact on democracy. It's an it's a, it's a effort funded by foundations, not getting a dime from Facebook. Um, but it's to answer these kinds of questions that is democracy having, uh, is uh, Facebook or our social media and the internet having a particular effect on democracy around the world? Now, speaking at the level of like 50,000 feet up, what are the fundamental challenges that the internet poses to democracy? And I think it's important that we focus on the unique challenges that the internet poses for democracy. Hate speech is as old as speech. Fake news is as old as news, okay? And so it's not just thinking about the misuse of um, speech for nefarious ends, but it's about, well, what is it that we're seeing with the technology? And, 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 and again, at the 50,000 foot, and then I'll just go about 10,000 feet below that. The, the first is, if we ever thought that this bedrock principle of First Amendment law, that the marketplace of ideas, the free, unregulated marketplace of ideas is the best test for truth, um, that has been undermined in the internet age. It's not clear it was ever true, okay? But it is not the case that the more speech that exists out there online, right, uh, is going to lead people then to be more likely to believe in true things. Um, related to that, and not necessarily unique to the internet, is how does a democracy so, uh, survive under conditions where there is not basic agreement on facts or minimal trust in institutions, including the media? And finally, how do, and, and this, this is really where it captures the, the influence of the World Wide Web on democracy, um, how do sovereign, democracy, sovereign democracies manage an information ecosystem which is no longer limited to human nationals, right, but extends to bots and foreigners, right? Again, if you were looking for things, again, just to, to frame it the, in a particular way, the unique influence of the, of the technology, something like bots, right, is clearly a unique uh, feature of the technology. All right, so let's just, I'm just gonna blow through uh, uh, some of these. Uh, I'll, I'll put them all up there to start. Whoops, <laughs> and then I'll take them away. Uh, what are these unique features? So there's a family of issues, uh, which I'll call velocity, virality, and volume. The speed at which information travels, the fact that it's done through peer-to-peer -peer transfer, and the sheer amount of information that we all have access to and are overwhelmed with on our cell phones, right? And so the point about the speed of information uh, traveling is that this, again, is a democracy-relevant question because elections are a date-specific event, right? And so you are less able to counteract a last-minute rumor in the internet age than you would have been previously. Now, it is true, right, that October surprises have happened throughout, uh, you know, electoral history, um, but, the capacity of elites to, um, uh, when campaign professionals and, and, and those on the inside to combat these last minute rumors is, is undermined by this. Um, second, well, I should say, you're all probably familiar with the, um, the quote, right? A lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can put its boots on. If you look on the internet, have you heard that? If you look on the internet, it's actually attributed to Mark Twain in 1917. He was actually dead in 1917, so it's sort of a, you know, fake news about fake news problem, but um, but there's something to that, right? Which is that that on the internet, um, viral communication, um, um, even if it's disconnected to truth, can get a wide audience in a very short period of time. And so, when we talk about virality and the threat that it poses to democracy, on the one hand, look, the lack lack of intermediaries is a key feature. It's in some ways the beauty of the internet, right? So. In the age of, uh, you know, when you had three white men who were the ones who were mediating uh, national broadcasting and decided what was news, right? Um, that would silence voices on the left, on the right, and, and even 
people that didn't fit on that spectrum, right? Um, now we've gone in the complete other direction where there's basically no elites that are mediators. I'll talk a little bit about the platforms in a second. But when it comes to what is news, right, what is journalism, what kind of communication that you will see, the coin of the realm is virality, which is privileged, of course, by search engines and newsfeed algorithms and the like. And so what is it about virality that poses this threat to, to democracy? And it's that it privileges certain types of candidates, campaigns, and tactics that appeal to certain emotions, right? Because emotional, what we know about viral transfer of information, right, is that uh, the things that are more likely to be spread are those things that appeal to your sense of outrage, sense of hate, sense of um, uh, emotional uh, um, uh, attachment. It could be love as well, you know, that's one of the reasons cat videos do so well, right? But it also privileges the kind of speech that is going to uh, then be more likely to be transferred peer to peer. Third is the sheer volume of information, which uh, was already uh, discussed before. Um, that is, so, so there's a sense in which we're, we're overwhelmed by the, the amount of information and communication that's coming to us, but that is also what gives us in some ways, the monopoly problem, which I'll talk about later, because this requires curation, right? The, the fact that we have all this information that we have access to, uh, and so those decisions about where to place certain information and the hierarchy that you give it are then even more important. Second, the anonymity problem. On the one hand, the First Amendment protects anonymity. Um, you know, anonymous speech is is a value, especially in authoritarian regimes, right? Twitter uh, and, and, you know, during the Arab Spring, uh, it's the anonymity of Twitter and other platforms that then could uh, be a shield uh, for protesters who were uh, fighting against their government, right? But it's anonymity which gives us the unaccountable speech on the internet as well as the bot problem, right? And so while there is actually a, a, a good debate out there as to whether hate speech online has actually been going up, it's actually not a, an easy answer if you look at the work by Josh Tucker at NYU and stuff. But there's no question that um, you know, in the internet age that uh, you are able to engage in unaccountable speech with a larger audience than you ever were before. Right? And so anonymous speakers have a megaphone that they never previously had. Related to that, and again, specifically uh, in, in the context of how the technology affects democracy, is the bot problem, right? And we can talk a lot about that in the, um, in the question and answer, and I think some of my colleagues might even be talking about it a little bit. Um, and so what is the bot problem, right? It's the problem of uh, uh, code essentially uh, masking as a human being. I mean, this is one of the manifestations of the bot problem. And so online, you as a consumer are unable to figure out whether the thing you are receiving information from or talking to is a human or is a bot, right? And uh, in the, again, thinking about the democracy harming potential here, it then leads to complete misrepresentation of the popularity of particular beliefs, the um, uh, popular, the, as you use bots to increase follower lists, popularity of certain leaders. And for the most part, what bots do is try to trick other bots Right, so that what the role of a bot is to kind of increase something on a search engine or make it more prominent in other algorithms. Um, but look, the President of the United States has retweeted bots over 100 times, okay? Um, even that's including before he was president. So it's not as if uh, these, bot, um, th these bots don't have actual human audiences that then magnify their effects. So, uh, so, and that again is clearly a manifestation of the technology which has a particular democracy harming effect. Fourth is sovereignty. I've already kind of mentioned that, which is how does a country, a democracy, um, um, regulate its democracy so that foreigners don't have uh, the power that say the Russians had in 2016. But there's another way of thinking about the sovereignty pro problem, especially if you're Europe or other countries outside the United States, which is that these American technology firms right, are having a disproportionate influence over domestic uh, democracies around the world. And so it is no um, surprise that, uh, you know, the EU and, and its constituent uh, countries uh, are very eager to regulate Facebook and Google and others because uh, they are exporters not just of American culture and the like, but also American views of what free expression is. 
right? And so we in the U.S. are way out on a limb when it comes to our theory of free speech in the First Amendment, right? Um, you know, Europe is, 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 you know, closer to us than it might be to China, but it's still, um, you know, it, it's still quite a ways away on things like obscenity and um, um, uh, hate speech and libel and the like. Uh, and so not only are these American companies exporting seemingly American uh, uh, culture and values, but particularly with respect to the information ecosystem and free speech. Right? And so that's why you, you see, uh, you know, the, the, these democracies do feel uh, threatened by those companies. Fourth, or fifth, is, is the problem of monopoly. And so, so the, the, the role of Facebook and Google um, in, in uh, the information ecosystem is simply you know, different than any other um, uh, media platform that existed in the non-internet age. And that's, uh, the import of that, again, for democracy is that in some ways their decisions and the, their terms of service and, and uh, community guidelines are in some ways more important than formal law when it comes to how political conversations are structured and organized. Uh, and so their decisions about what is incitement, what is hate speech, right, whether they're going to demote um, uh, false news, fake news, disinformation, um, are critical. If you look at their community guidelines in terms of service, if the government in the U.S. Re uh, legislated them, they'd all be unconstitutional, okay? Whether it's obscenity or hate speech or the like, right? Um, but how they, they do that delegate dance really makes a difference. And more importantly, how they figure out how to navigate uh, the, the hundreds of over 100 countries that they are present in with consistent community guidelines in terms of service that need to be responsive to the national uh, legal cultures is an extremely difficult problem. All right, I've got a few more minutes. Let me just say, um, I'll say just one thing uh, uh, about the sources of reform. Obviously, there's government regulation, there's platform self-regulation, then there's the rest of us of what we can do um, to try to, to uh, deal with some of these problems. And I can talk about more about that in the Q&A. But let me just rattle off what I think the reform universe looks like. It all happens to begin with D. That was not intentional. Um, 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 but, 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 but let me just throw it out there. So the, of the reforms that, that, that can be um, promoted at, either, at any of these levels, whether it's government or, or the platforms or civil society, they take this kind of character. Deletion of content, takedowns, right? Um, and as I said, the, we should not pretend that these environments on Facebook or, the, or YouTube and the like are um, the Boston Commons, right? These are highly regulated speech environments that um, make certain decisions about copyright law or about obscenity and the like. And the question is, are there additional areas, whether it's disinformation, more on hate speech and the like, where, where it should be included? Most people focus on those takedown requests. Those are the ones that get the kind of um, notoriety and infamy if, for example, InfoWars gets taken down or something. But the more important decisions are often made algorithmically as to what appears at the top and what appears at the bottom, right? So questions about demotion of content are in some ways the most important questions that these uh, 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 platforms make because if you're not on that first page of Google search results, you basically don't exist. And if you're, you could exist on Facebook, but not be in someone's news feed, right? And then uh, you're not going to get the kind of exposure. Third is disclosure. This is the favorite of all reformers and, and in some ways the platforms themselves. If only, if only we gave people more information, they would realize what's good for them. Uh, you know, and so you get that little I in, um, uh, uh, in, in the news feed, right? So if you want to actually figure out what kind of publication is the New York Times, you can click on the I and you'll find it's, uh, you know, a pub newspaper in New York. Um, um, but they'll do that for all kinds of other uh, publications. Or they tried to get at news that was disputed by fact checkers and so they would put a disputed flag in front of it. And you know probably the story of what happened there. Put something like disputed in red lettering on Facebook and then people are like, oh, disputed, let me engage with that. Right, and, and so these have all kinds of backfire uh, effects. Fourth is delay. This was an interesting idea that Krishna Bharat had, who was former head of Google News, which is that we should put tripwires in on the internet for problematic content. Actually, not just problematic content, but content that achieves a certain level of virality. If you think virality is part of the problem here, then you may want to force some kind of human observation on stories that achieve a certain level of, um, of virality. Uh, fifth. Is, is dilution. This is the, 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 the um, 
I'll actually do, deal, deal with dilution, distraction, and diversion together, which is that you try to flood the zone with good content if you think there's bad content out there. That's actually, the Europeans are in a better position to do this, especially the Northern Europeans, if you have robust public broadcasting uh, systems that are, that are um, you know, well-funded and, and have trust and reach. You know, it's not like NPR or PBS is gonna be able to confront uh, uh, um, any major disinformation campaign in the US. Um, Distraction and diversion is a little bit different. The, the, so it's taking someone whose attention is toward one piece of content that you might think is harmful and trying to shift it elsewhere. Interestingly, this is what the Chinese actually do, uh, more so than, than just straight up deletion, although there's plenty of censorship on the Chinese internet too. Um, uh, my colleague Jennifer Pan at, at Stanford has some great work that shows that a lot of what happens is taking people's attention if they're in discussion groups about Subject X, say Tiananmen Square, and then shifting it towards other types of topics. Right? You might think that that's also what's happening in the U.S. political system, which is to say, you know, we're just confronted with a series of communication and events and scandals, so we get uh, distracted. It's also, I mean, it sounds like a nef nefarious kind of actor model, but if you think about the way that uh, the platforms deal with terrorist content, a lot of time what they will do if you put into a search engine that you're looking, you know, if you have something that, that signals terrorist recruitment, they will try to shift your attention, guide your attention toward other content, which is um, uh, basically providing a message against that. The last two are deterrence and digital literacy. Deterrence can be thought of in the kind of classic mode that, look, if you think the Russians uh, meddled in the U.S. election, you can go after them. You don't have to go after them online. You can go after them just like we did in any other uh, war scenario. Um, uh, but there are other ways, and the platforms perform a role in, in deterring this bad behavior. For example, you all are probably familiar with the story of the Macedonian teenagers in the 2016 election, right? This group of teenagers who figured, hey, there was a lot of money to be made through gaming the Google algorithm with these kind of pro-Trump, um, largely disinforming uh, sites. Um, and so what did Google and Facebook do after the election? They drained those uh, uh, publications of uh, money. Finally, is digital literacy, which everyone holds, it's like, who could be against digital literacy? And I, Lord knows, as a professor, I'm not going to be. Uh, but that, and we have a project at Stanford that Sam Weinberg and the education department has come up with to try to encourage digital literacy, especially among young people. Turns out, young people are probably not the problem. Um, all, the, all the research now on disinformation is suggesting that it's old people. Um, people who are new to the internet, uh, who then are, you know, um, uh, have fewer friends, say, on Facebook, and then um, some of the algorithmic determinations with the motion are not working. And so they, older people, then end up um, uh, spreading fake news. So you probably need digital literacy, not necessarily in the high schools, uh, where those students are more digitally literate than I am, uh, but actually in, uh, I don't know, on, on, on whatever the equivalent would be for, for older Americans. Um, and and uh, I should say digital literacy takes on a different valence in other parts of the world. So if you talk to people at Facebook and Google about what they think about with digital literacy, it goes beyond like the kind of mass sort of education about here, you shouldn't believe everything that's online, but literally education about how the products work, right? making sure people understand how Facebook works, how the news feed works, what you can do to adjust your settings and things like that, all of which is a good idea. I've run out of time, so let me just, I'll just uh, uh, talk for 10 seconds about what the future holds. Um, and this, unfortunately, is gonna end on a downer. Uh, but that is, we focus on things like, like Facebook and Google here in the United States. The real story about what's happening around the world when it comes to democracy is the rise of encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, which are, are almost impossible to regulate in, this, in the same way, right? That you cannot, we don't really even know the scale of things like hate speech and disinformation on those platforms. Um, and it's the platforms themselves, unless they wanna recreate themselves as something else, don't really know about the content. The assistive devices like Alexa and Siri and Google Home and the like, sort of make the disinformation problem even more disconcerting as well as the monopoly problem. So at least right now, when you ask a question to Google, you could get 10 blue links, right? If you look at, for example, the way my kids talk to Alexa or Siri, they're like, you know, who's the president of the United States, right? And you get one answer. But you could also be asking Alexa or Siri, did three to five million voters 
uh, vote illegally in the last election, right? And now these assistive devices have to give, they give you an answer, right? Third, the one that everyone focuses a lot on, and we at Stanford are, are, are doing a lot of work potentially injurious in this area, is um, the problem of deep, deep fakes and altered video. If you think fake news is a problem, what happens when you won't be able to believe your lying eyes? Um, this is a, a problem that will come at us quicker than we think, and it's also the remedies that people are thinking about here, like trying to have a library of images and like, is, um, is, not, is only gonna be working for about five years. Within five to 10 years, it will be very difficult to detect whether a video is fake or real. Uh, last two, and, and I should say that that is also part of a larger phenomenon, which is that it's becoming increasingly difficult with technology to discern the difference between virtual or artificial uh, uh, presentation and actual reality. And the final thing, especially as we think about elections, it, while Cambridge Analytica was a kind of Bush League operation that, that just puffed their um, brand, um, there are other groups like this that are out there. These, the, the problem of election um, intervention and the use of sophisticated technologies like troll farms and bots is now out there for hire. And so uh, domestic governments and political parties, now there is an industry there where you can rely on consultancies uh, to help you with that. Um, and while I said I was ending on a downer, let me try to give you some hope, which is that I've been trying to write a book on democracy and the internet for the last like four years, and every six months, the topic changes, okay? And so while things look pretty bleak right now, um, there's, you know, uh, things are changing extremely rapidly. And so we're in a kind of period of entropy here where it's very difficult to see what's right around the corner. And so uh, while that uncertainty might make you nervous, it should also give you some hope because the problems of today might be very different than the problems of tomorrow. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me in this panel. My name is Maciej Cegłowski. Uh, I am a kind of grumpy computer programmer from just over the water in San Francisco. Uh, I really have, I don't have academic credentials, I have very little political background, but like a lot of tech people in late 2016, I panicked, uh, and as part of expressing our panic, we began to meet together uh, in a group I founded called Tech Solidarity trying to come up with ways that we could take the tools that we had spent so much time building, tools of surveillance, uh, manipulation, and stop them from being used against people we really cared about. It was a, a, a moment of, of shock and panic for many in the tech community, particularly because uh, there had been some naivete about what exactly we were building uh, with sites like Google and Facebook that aggregated data for so many people. So out of that panic, uh, the dust settled a little bit. Uh, before the administration took office, it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Are we going straight to you know, street fighting and reenacting 1933, or are we gonna have some steps along the way? Uh, what kind of a dance is the authoritarian slide? It turns out it's a dance with many steps. So as it's become clear that the political process continues, uh, the midterm elections, which are coming up right around the corner, were the obvious locus of activity uh, for two big reasons. One is simply because if we are going to repudiate what happened in 2016 and repudiate this kind of politics that we've seen, uh, it has to happen in this election. We can win other elections later, but this is the one that decides whether we put up a hand and say stop or it becomes the new normal and things continue in this vein. Uh, and the other reason is, is kind of you know, gerrymandering plus, which is that the 2020 census will be taking place, and uh, creative people can come up with many ways to game it in a way that will structurally lock in uh, a Republican vote for the next decade. Um, these, are, these methods can be legal or illegal, but even the legal ones uh, are very effective if you want to get a permanent undercount. So combining that with the kind of gerrymandering we talked about earlier today makes it obvious that this is an election that we absolutely have to win, and the only place we can really win it is the House because the Senate is structurally designed so you can't really get these huge swings in, uh, in control, especially this year. Uh, so all of that convinced me that you know, we really need to focus on the midterm elections. I, I'm, like I said, I'm a programmer, so from first principles I arrive at obvious conclusions that everybody else already understood. Uh, 
In 2017, I started just traveling all the time, started meeting with congressional campaigns. And at the outset, I understood a little bit about the political moment and the realignment that's taking place in the United States. And then after a year of traveling where I've been in 21 states, I have uh, met with 40 congressional campaigns. Uh, I've realized I understand nothing whatsoever about the political moment or what's happening. Um, worse than that, I don't think many other people do either. Nobody really knows who's a political uh, practitioner, what is going to happen 15 days from now or 18, whatever agonizingly slow days are adding up to. And it's kind of like the opposite of QAnon. If you know QAnon, it's this idea that all the chaos that's happening and, and the drama in the various parts of the administration is part of a master plan. It's almost the opposite. The institutions that seem to be working normally and people who seem to be in positions of power and competence are also just coasting and, and operating on pure inertia. It's a very scary thing to discover, especially about the political process. Uh, but you know, we work with, with the hand that we're dealt. So, I've been working on two separate tracks. One is a nonpartisan one where we were just in conjunction with some people in the security community. We we're trying to get to as many congressional campaigns as possible to give them some basic public health style training about email security, avoiding the John Podesta scenario that ensnared uh, Democrats in 2016. This is a challenging thing where you have maybe an hour of attention from someone who's extremely busy and non-technical and you're trying to convey what is the equivalent of boil your water and wash your hands for a working congressional campaign where everybody is focused on growing, expanding, bringing in volunteers, and the idea of security where you're trying to restrict people is anathema. And the other part of my work is purely partisan where I was fundraising and trying to be a hose that connected the pockets of tech workers in San Francisco and New York and other places uh, with the very hungry campaign budgets of progressives running in rural districts, where it is hard to fundraise locally, particularly if you don't have uh, you know, the Harvard Law Rolodex, or you didn't work for a big NGO, so you don't have connections to a donor network. So this led to a project called The Great Slate, where, uh, like I said, we've had 13 campaigns that I've just been circulating, circulating among and visiting nonstop. We have managed to raise $4 million for them, whether that's going to help or not, I have absolutely no idea. It has inculcated in me a deep disgust for the campaign finance laws uh, and the system that we have. Um, the nice way to frame what we're doing is that we're hacking the campaign finance system so that we're preventing candidates from being forced to spend all of their time on phones raising money. Uh, but as Ingrid put it, when you talk about these hacks, Really, you're talking about a broken system that you're trying to patch up. So what we're trying to patch up is the kind of corporate capture of, of, of campaign finance. Uh, the problem is that what is inspirational and nice this year, the news you saw about all these campaigns that have raised grassroots money and, and you know, more than ever in the Democratic primary now, in the next cycle, that's just going to be co-opted by the experts at fundraising uh, in, in, in another, into another way to manipulate more money into coming into the system. Uh, so it's a frustration. But if you want to change the system, you have to win elections from inside it, and that's the, uh, that's the crux of, of the effort. So because we're a panel, I just want to throw a couple of like, grumpy provocations at you and, and, and see how you feel about them. Um, the first is kind of an accounting of what exactly happened to us in 2016. Um, I want to use this analogy. Like, say you're sitting at home in your kitchen eating breakfast, and someone throws a rock through your window. The first question that comes to your mind is obviously going to be who threw that and why? And then you know maybe if the rock has a note wrapped around it, you might read that and try to glean motives. But if you're sitting in your kitchen and someone throws a rock through your window and your roof collapses, your first question isn't who threw the rock, it's what is wrong with my house? <laughs> why did the roof collapse? Uh, and I think that that is really what we saw happen in our democracy. If you remember in 2002, there was an election in France uh, where a kind of popular right-wing demagogue who was completely unacceptable by the standards of the political system, won the primary and got into the final presidential election against an establishment candidate who was widely disliked and unpopular, considered to be corrupt. But the French electorate held their noses and elected, uh, I think the, the slogan was elect the crook and not the, you know, not the fascist, by something like 82 to 17. Uh, and the question we have to answer here is why, why was the election close? The, the heartbreak of a, of a close election is that every reason is the reason that, that we lost it. So yes, it was the last minute Comey stuff, and yes, it was misogyny, and yes, it was the Russians and whoever else. Uh, you can make several strong cases for things that swung the election because it was on a knife edge. 
but why wasn't it 82 to 17? And I think that we've seen since then that kind of steady 40, 45% popularity for the president demonstrates that this is real. This isn't just, you know, people are looking at this rock that came through the window and, and, and caused the roof to collapse. And they're like, what kind of rock is this? What is this magic substance that can destroy democracies? Some kind of Siberian kryptonite, you know, advanced KGB spies out in the far, uh, far reaches of Russia who are figuring out how to, how to subvert our institutions. The answer is more prosaic, is that they were just, you know, there was rock everywhere to, to begin with. Uh, we've had 40 years of flat wages. We've had uh, kind of, I think we're in our 17th year of, of a national state of emergency. Two wars that somehow have not even become a campaign topic anymore. Uh, we have, if you travel through the deindustrialized parts of the United States, I found a, a, a giant furniture mill in, uh, northern Georgia that had been actually strip mined for its oaken floors uh, because they were used in luxury high-rise condos because they were the good kind of oak that supported all the mill machinery that was so heavy. This is like being Slavoj Zizek on easy mode. You know, anywhere you go, you just like see three things you can write an essay about and, and be very cool and kind of pomo. Uh, but it's also real and people, this is people's lived reality. And I think that not acknowledging this decay in our institutions, and particularly in the institution of journalism, which is somewhere where the internet has had an incredibly corrosive effect by swapping out the, the kind of business model that underpins it, but is also a process that goes beyond the internet. You know, Fox News started before internet times, this kind of uh, corporate capture of local, uh, local newspapers predates the internet. But this is an ongoing process, and the problem is that you can't hack your way out of it and restore it quickly. You have to rebuild it organically and help it grow. The other provocation I want to I want to give you is this. We're told two conflicting things about voting uh, that are mutually incompatible. One of them is that every vote counts. Your vote is important. This is the most important election of a lifetime. If you don't vote, you can't complain. The other thing we're told is that these elections are decided by battleground districts or swing states. And even in swing states, if you're lucky enough to live inside one, if you're part of certain communities, your vote is not a swing vote. I don't know when is the last time that you know, African Americans were not just treated as a default Democratic voting bloc, for example. So there's a dissonance. Uh, and the way that politics is described in, by the pundit class is almost like sports. There's a small professional class of people who practice it, and then the, the great masses are expected to be on a team. You root for one side or the other. And it's your job as a fan to get out there and cheer, but you are not in any way expected to participate. So we begin to see the, the apparatus and machinery of advertising that works so well in persuading people to buy products you know, is used in the same way in the political process where, again, a, something that predates the internet by far, but trying to micro-target people, market to them, position candidates, but not in any way make it an interactive process. There was a beautiful moment right after the 2016 election where Mark Zuckerberg tried to argue that Facebook was wonderful at convincing people to buy products, but of course it had no impact on political decisions, even though you know, they, were, uh, they were selling it aggressively to political campaigns. So I think that if, if we want a way out of this dark impasse that we're in politically, there has to be a way to create a politics that is somehow participatory, and perhaps this can use some of the tools that you know, we, we've been criticizing today uh, but could be repurposed. I think one reason that people have gotten excited for the effort that I've been leading, the Great Slate, where we've had, I think, 10,000 individual donors, we've had $4 million, is simply because giving money gives people some agency and a small sense of connection. So when, if you're a tech worker in Palo Alto and you donate to a uh, campaign, uh, Kyle Horton's campaign that was hit badly by a hurricane in, in North Carolina, you're making a small connection, you're invested, and you feel good about that. That feeling is very elusive in politics. And the only place I've found it uh, where that seems to be working is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with what's going on there with the organizing efforts by Lancaster Stands Up with the Jess King campaign. It is a very ambitious effort to try to politicize and mobilize an entire community. This is deep in Amish country, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's a Mennonite community using some of the tools of, of digital democracy, using just a lot of sweat and time and 
meetings where you sit in a, in a room with others and knocking on doors with your neighbors. I guess in 15 days we find out if it works. But this, I think, is the only way forward. It also provides a kind of, uh, kind of almost like an airbag or a cushion against these aggressive viral forms of disinformation. It's because if you are in a conversation about politics with your neighbors, with your friends, in the real world and not in everything mediated through software, you have more, uh, you're more resilient against attempts to manipulate you. But of course, you can't do this from scratch in congressional districts where there's 700,000 people. It has to be some sort of local grassroots effort. And this ties back into how do you rebuild institutions on the local level, union halls, churches, uh, civic institutions like rotary clubs, all these things that have been allowed to atrophy or aggressively attack for so many years. So that's you know, kind of my, uh, my entire reason for being here is because I got so angry at the title of this event, Hacking Politics, because I think that hacking in my mind, even though I'm a computer programmer, I come from this culture, it is a sort of smug circumvention of established rules. And we've smugly circumvented our way into uh, a hot mess where we have, even here locally in California, even walking outside you know, through downtown Berkeley, you can see the massive disconnect between the wealth and happiness and success of the tech community that has built this new world and its failure to kind of more broadly get plowed into uh, to the national economy. So, uh, you know, before I call for a violent revolution, which I think in Berkeley is, is the expected way to conclude a talk, uh, I just want to thank you and I look forward to talking to everybody during the discussion. Well, thank you everyone for the invitation to be here, and it's uh, really exciting to be part of this panel. I was just talking about um, how this event has been great in terms of meeting people from different research areas and uh, different backgrounds. So my name is Girija, and um, I'm coming here from a computer science and background. My, traditionally, my work would be in control, information theory, broadly speaking, AI. And moving into talking about politics is something that is relatively new for me. It's a project that started actually um, right on the tails of the previous talk, something that happened soon after the election in 2016, where a bunch of us started thinking, wait, what, what just happened? Um, so at this time, I was a researcher at Microsoft Research. And soon after the election, a bunch of colleagues and I started discussing well, what can we as technologists do and try to understand about the political landscape? And a term that was circulating a lot at the time was this word called fake news. And it was something that was new, we didn't quite understand it, and we wanted to understand, well, what is fake news? And in the process of trying to understand this, we embarked on the study of various uh, browsing behaviors from uh, the logs at Microsoft Research. And I'll proceed to describe some of this research as well as uh, follow-on research that we've been doing. So we started our study in December 2016, soon after the um, 2016 presidential election. And we focused on this period right between the uh, primaries and the November election, so from July to November 2016. And at this time, you were starting to see these headlines, uh, such as the stories about the Macedonian teenagers that were brought up, um, or you know, potential questions about, wait, did Facebook play a role in this? Was social media important? Was it not important? These were the kind of questions that people were starting to ask and starting to think about. And it was after this, it was in you know, late December and early January, that uh, the political space actually took up this term, fake news. Uh, the first mention of fake news by Hillary Clinton actually came in December 2016. For example, in response to the Pizzagate story, which many people may have heard about in this room, um, where someone actually ended up walking into a pizza parlor with a gun because of a rumor that there was some kind of pedophile ring in the basement of that pizza parlor. Um, later on, uh, our president-elect at the time, uh, Donald Trump, also started tweeting about this phenomena. And 
soon after this, there was questions not just about some kind of fake news, did some kind of teenager pull a prank that fooled a large fraction of the, fraction of the electorate, but there started being questions raised about, wait, was there a systematic misinformation or disinformation campaign that was run potentially by the Russians um, in the context of the 2016 election and soon after? And there have been uh, a lot of reports and uh, congressional investigations into this. So what I will talk about in the second part of the talk is actually some of the specifics of this campaign. So we will specifically examine um, work that was done by the Internet Research Agency, which is a Russian-based, Russia-based company. They spent over uh, 68,000 US dollars from 2015 to 2017 on Facebook ad spend alone. What I'm showing over here are some examples of ads that were run by, uh, by the Internet Research Agency campaign. And um, according to <coughs> recent investigations, for example, one of the quotes about this campaign has been that the express intention of this was to sow discord in the US political system, including in the 2016 US presidential election. So soon after, kind of, there was a lot of discussion about, well, you know, what had happened, can we understand it? In May 2018, uh, something really interesting happened, which is that congressional testimony led to the release of Facebook ads that were generated by the IRA, as well as a series of Twitter handles that uh, were known to be controlled by agents from Russia. And the majority of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is based on this data that was released in conjunction with data that was obtained through working at Microsoft Research. Uh, interestingly, soon after May 2018 is when Alex Spanger, who is in our audience here, uh, started as an intern with us at Microsoft Research. And he's one of the main drivers behind uh, all of this work, as well as a great resource if you want to talk more about this. So I'll talk about two studies in, this, in the course of the next 15 minutes. Uh, the first one will be focusing on trying to understand the broader phenomena of fake news in the context of information that was released primarily before the 2016 US presidential election. And this was a study that was done in collaboration with colleagues at Microsoft Research. And the second study that I'll be talking about is trying to specifically understand the impact of the content that was released by the Internet Research Agency. And this is a work that was done more recently with uh, and, and led by Alex, also in collaboration with people at uh, MSR. So let me start with um, some websites that you may have seen. I'm sure pretty many people in this room are familiar with abcnews.com. Um, some of you may have even visited either of these web pages, but probably one of them looks a little bit odd to you. <coughs> Something very interesting about these two web pages is while they both have the title ABC News, they have different URLs. One is abcnews.com.co, the other is abcnews.go.com. And an interesting piece of information about these two uh, websites is the former got over 90% of its traffic from social media, whereas the latter has only about 20% of its traffic coming from social media. The former is also claiming that the Pledge of Allegiance was banned across public schools in the United States. But what we were trying to investigate in the course of uh, our study was, wait, what is the effect of websites like this and how are they actually propagated? And one of the things that we heard a lot, uh, especially from the media, was, oh, uh, social media is largely responsible for fake news. Everything uh, that we're seeing is rumors that are generated by Macedonian teenagers that then spread virally uh, via Facebook. 
And one of the things that we wanted to try and do was try and put some kind of numbers to uh, be able to understand quantitatively um, what, what is actually the spread and what is actually happening here. So if you look at this particular story, actually what I'm showing here is a histogram of traffic to this exact story, um, starting again from the primaries all the way up until the election in 2016. And what you're seeing is a stacked histogram. So the fraction of the bar that is blue is the fraction of traffic that came to this particular website via social media. And red is traffic that came from, you know, they either landed up on the site organically, someone sent them an email, they found it through search, uh, something else like that. And you can see for this particular story, it really went viral as a function of um, social media. And you can see that there's also a trend in how, how it's being spread. Like there, there's, you know, it, it starts growing and then it, then, it, then it reaches a peak. And it turned out that there, are actu there were actually kind of a large chunk of websites that we looked at that did have this exact same pattern. I choose this because it's a good representative example of these stories that basically drew all of their traffic and all of their eyeballs from being linked to on social media. And this was a story that we had heard circulating a lot in the media. But the most surprising thing, um, there were many other things we looked at, but I just wanted, in the interest of time, I wanted to point out something else. Is the thing that was surprising to me is that there was actually an entire other category of types of stories and websites that got a lot of traffic and eyeballs right before the election that did not get any users on them from social media at all. So for example, uh, this is a story from Infowars.com. And it's questioning whether Hillary Clinton was wearing an earpiece during some kind of uh, forum or debate. And again, I'm plotting the exact same histogram. What you see here is that there's almost no blue. Two things to notice. One, most of the people that saw this story saw it all on the same day. So they got to it either through a news aggregator, through the homepage, or through being sent an email. Secondly, they didn't come to it from social media. They came from somewhere else. And so it seems that in addition to these organic stories that were maybe started as a prank and went viral, there were clearly systematic ways that people were trying to spread certain kinds of information. And this is an example of, of one of them. So this brings me to talking a little bit more about the IRA work, which I'll do in just a minute. But I wanted to just show this plot before we, we got to the next part of the talk. What I'm showing here is on the x-axis is the fraction of voters in a particular state that voted for uh, Donald Trump. And the y-axis is the fraction of our users, uh, browsing users, that uh, visited a fake news site. And I can tell you what we, how we define the fake news site. Every dot on this graph represents a state. And what we see is a very strong correlation. As you see a larger number of um, people visiting a fake news website, you see that they're also more likely to be in a state that voted for Donald Trump. What I want to emphasize here is what we're plotting here is a correlation and absolutely not any kind of causation. And it's a correlation that can be explained very simply by the kinds of factors that were pointed out in Nate's talk. Um, for example, homophily uh, within social networks, as well as the fact that it has been documented that there was a lot more pro-Trump um, fake news that was generated compared to pro-Clinton news. So, while there is nothing to be said in terms of causation, we cannot at all use this to conclude that, oh, fake news had any kind of influence on the, uh, on the election. Nonetheless, it's, it's something interesting that points out an interesting correlation between the kind of information we're consuming and what it says about, says about the populations in aggregate. So just some details about the study. Um, I can talk more about these if people are interested, but I will move to other um, more interesting things in the interest of time, which is the basically second study that, uh, we, that I wanted to mention, which is focusing entirely on information that was spread in the US uh, 
by the IRA. So here's another website that maybe some people in this room have visited. It's called Black Matters US. It's a website that has talked largely about um, you know, issues around, for example, the Black Lives Matter campaign. Um, and turns out, this is also a website that was actually uh, generated and hosted entirely by uh, the Internet Research Agency. It's based out of Russia, but talks to a lot of progressive um, American, American issues. <coughs> And what we basically tried to do in our uh, work was try and understand the different types of information that was spread in the US by the, uh, by the Internet Research Agency. And we based this primarily off of the data that was released by Facebook and Twitter in the congressional testimonies that happened around May 2018. So what I want to outline is kind of what our guess of what a basic structure of their strategy might have looked like. So what we see is that there was two different kind of vectors by which people arrived at some of this content. One they call the passive, which is web search, you know, through either Bing or Google. And another is more of an active promotion style, which might be, for example, Facebook or, or Twitter. And these two pathways led users to domains such as the Black Matters US website that I just showed you, uh, that are actually hosted and maintained by the IRA, as well as entities on social media, for example, uh, Facebook groups such as Blacktivists or Stop All Invaders. I'll show some examples later on. There's also a bunch of Twitter handles and Twitter users that uh, both create and promote content. And finally, some of these domains, as well as the Facebook groups, had a lot of um, links to real world events. So for example, connections to meetup groups, pages where people could donate, ways to connect and sign up for email lists, things where you know things that happen in the virtual world could actually lead to action in the in the physical world. And I and I show this figure because this was something that kind of took us a lot of time to come together. We saw kind of different parts of this as we were stra starting to dig through the data. And this is our best guess as to how we think this might have been organized. And after we see it this way, it was quite, it was quite surprising to all of us that, oh, maybe this was actually this systematically organized. So for example, soon after you are on the Black Matters US website, within like a few seconds, this is a pop-up that shows up which asks, do you want to be notified, and asks you for an email address. And you might think that one of the main things that was, uh, this website was trying to do was trying to promote divisive agenda. Um, but this is another example of a story that uh, got actually a lot of traffic on this website. And this story is talking about uh, black female computer scientists. How many do you know? And this was a story that was released soon after, um, or it was, it referenced Katherine Johnson and Hidden Figures and um, actually turned out to be a story that was promoted by um, a Microsoft search engine uh, promotion, I guess, on computer lock screens that was driven, that drove traffic to this as, you know, an informational educational article about you know, women and black women in computer science, which is something that um, many people were, you know, thinking that this is a great thing to be promoting, but not knowing that this is actually a website that is entirely driven by um, a Russian agent. So what we wanted to try and understand is like, okay, we have this kind of sense of something going on here. What can we uncover about the structure of this campaign? So one of the things we looked at was well, how are people arriving at, uh, for example, this website, Black Matters US? And so what we saw was that actually roughly 50-50% of the traffic came from search versus social media. But the kinds of specific stories that people landed at when they came from search versus social media was quite different. So for example, the stories that people arrived at when they came from search, when they were just trying to find information, 
turned out to be um, less, less intense emotionally compared to the stories that were actively promoted on social media. So people who came from search were just trying to find some information. For example, they were doing a so science project on you know, women in computer science and ended up on a particular, ended up on a site, which then led them to be notified, maybe then led them to find um, other content. But on the other hand, the content that was promoted actively through social media was, one, was, was much more emotionally intense. Similarly, we looked at the political leanings of the stories that were promoted and uh, again compared them based on how people arrived at them. And what we see here again is that this green bar for apolitical, the search bar, is again much higher. So that means that people who arrived at these, uh, people arrived at apolitical stories using search much more often than they arrived at it using social media. But for example, uh, left-leaning stories, people arrived at them uh, very often through Facebook and much less often through search. Um, so here, this is another, so that's like Black Matters US is one example of a property that was maintained and developed by the IRA. But that's just one example. Another example is a wide array of Facebook groups and these are groups, basically these are pages that maintain a, maintain a membership, they create content, they generate videos, they you know, get people to try and go to meetups. Blacktivists is a group that, um, again, was created entirely by the IRA and one of the, was one of the most popular groups. And it was advertised through, again, these ads. And some of the common tags that were used in advertising this group are, for example, target to people whose interests are African-American history or Black Lives Matter or Martin Luther King. Um, I can give you the extensive list of exactly which tags were used. But what is interesting is what this figure is showing is the fraction of people, a fraction of users in a state that actually clicked on one of the ads that linked to um, this particular group. And what you see is that there's some states that are lighting up as having more clicks than others. And if you do it, if you actually were to plot a correlation on a county by county basis, what you would see is that um, ads and groups that were, for example, in the category uh, African American history um, have a 0.7 correlation with counties that are majority African American. So it seems that using tags that are just based on interests, it is quite possible to have very fine demographic targeting. And we see from some of this data that um, even though it's a small amount of data, that this kind of demographic targeting does seem to be, does seem to be happening to some extent. So I'm close to out of time, so I will kind of wrap up. There's a lot more stuff I can say about exactly you know, how ads drove traffic, um, some of the strategies that were used, for example, you can see that sometimes traffic gets driven by ads. In this case, this is an example of a Facebook group, group where the ads actually did not drive traffic. But here, what you can see is that there's a lot of ways to free promote your stuff. For example, uploading lots of photos and videos to your group gets people to come and show eyeballs on it. And so what this is showing is that the, one of the tactics was to upload lots of fo photos and videos to the group to get people to come in. There are other places where actually buying clicks uh, made a big difference. I'll skip this in the interest of time, but it seems that a lot of the content that was purchased and promoted was left-leaning, in particular on Facebook, and this had a big impact in terms of driving traffic. Um, it had a bigger impact, especially in terms of, as compared to, dr to driving traffic to the right-leaning uh, political ads. And I didn't have time much to talk about this, but there was a similar campaign that was also uh, that also happened on Twitter. So 10GOP is a Twitter handle, for example, that was also controlled by the IRA. And one of their strategies there seems to have been to investigate and tweet about local developing stories before news agencies have been able to actually, you know, go in and do in-depth uh, investigation. So this is, for example, a 
a spike of impressions that is being received for this 10 GOP Twitter handle, which is IRA controlled. And what this graph is showing here is that a lot of eyeballs, you know, search results returned this particular tweet because the news stories on this particular issue happened the next day. This tweet came out because they didn't need to do any investigation the day that the story was evolving. Most of the news happened the next day, so they got a lot of eyeballs. So there's a lot of clearly well thought out strategy that went on here. I don't have time to go into all of these details, but I'll just say thanks to Alex for you know being really the leader on this job, as well as a group of students that's working here at Berkeley um, on trying to move this ball forward. Thanks. So here's a, here's a question to kick this off. Um, Nate, you led off with a kind of a withering critique of the internet's harm in undermining democracy. And then, uh, Mathieu, we, we heard a description of something that sounded very much like a determination to avail yourself of the tools of the internet to mobilize and reinvigorate and, and uh, activate democracy. And in fact, uh, it, it, your, your critique as well was a portrait of a system that appears to be taking advantage of the tools of the internet in ways that uh, the internet appears to be an intensifier, making flaws worse and burnishing virtues perhaps. It doesn't seem to be undermining, it seems to be reanimating and reactivating democracy. So I wonder whether we could have a conversation about how bad is it and maybe it's better than bad. I mean, so when I give this talk, I usually get three criticisms. One is what you think is new is actually old. The second is what you think is bad is actually good. And the third is what you think is original is something I published on already. Right? And so, <laughs> and so Look, like I said, it's a tool like any other. It can be used for good or it can be used for ill. But I think the point that I wanted to emphasize is that there are features of the technology that inherently cause stresses for the democracy. The worldwide nature of the web, right, is a challenge to sovereignty. The privileging of anonymity and virality um, privileges certain types of speech over others that, that would have been uh, mediated in and maybe stopped in the pre-internet age. And so, yes, it still has the potential for, for good because it is, it is I mean, here, here's one way to be additionally pro provocative, which is that it is the most democratic features of the internet which threaten democracy, right? Which is that it is those things that, are, that we are celebrating which actually are the most destabilizing um, and they're taking uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, the politics in a particular direction. Um, but, but yes, there's still a lot to be celebrated and, and you know, even something like anonymity has uh, costs and benefits. Um, and of course, taking out these yeah, limited I, groups of well, intermediaries. Then, uh, yeah. then let me take it. Yeah. I, I wonder why it's particularly undermining democracy. It sounds to me like it's undermining authority. And certainly the Chinese don't believe, the Chinese aren't suppressing the internet because they're wanting to protect democracy. It seems to me that wherever you have constituted authority, the internet poses unique challenges. Mm -hmm. Why it's any greater in, in a democratic system than in an authoritarian system, I, I, I'm not seeing that. And I wonder, I mean, you obviously, Machier, you're availing yourself, you're gleefully jumping in mm -hmm. and using these same opportunities to reach large numbers of people, mobilize them quickly around directed action, you're using that as a, as a tool to perfect democracy, if you like. So I'd say two things. I'm really worried that I'm, I'm in violent agreement with my co-panelists, which is never a good place to be. <laughs> we'll find somewhere to disagree. But uh, one thing is that this is, a, this is a dynamic process. So mm -hmm. if you remember, I think it was Obama's uh, use of Facebook ads originally that prompted a lot of, of optimism about this is a brand new form of democracy. Nobody thought that these kind of same techniques would be used more effectively by the right, which they ended up being used by. So you're one step ahead. All the stuff that I'm doing that's fun and inspirational now around fundraising will just be grim and horrible in 2020 when people have studied it and then just you know use it to squeeze more money more effectively than this ad hoc effort. 
But also there's some qualities of these platforms that are intrinsic. For example, Twitter rewards strife. It is a place for performative outrage. And my most effective fundraising is by being constantly performatively outraged on Twitter. And I can literally quantify how much that earns me. There's one specific example I have in mind, which is a fundraiser, my first one ever that I organized in December in New York City. I rented a Unitarian church, also a first time in my life, hopefully last thing, uh, because it's very stressful to rent an entire building, and I got 20 people to show up. Uh, fortunately, those 20 people in front of three candidates donated something like $30,000, I think out of sheer social awkwardness at being <laughs> alone in a church. But when I posted this on Twitter and then got someone to call me a liar for saying that, I was able to raise $60,000 within four hours of that tweet, and then it had a tail on it. So I raised way more by, by creating Twitter drama about a real life event than I did by getting those people to come into that room. But the people who came into that room, I mean, they, you know, they got on the subway, they made an effort. That, that was the nucleus of something lasting, and the Twitter drama, you know, it came and it went. Mm -hmm. That's what I really worry about. You know, this is, so I think, like, you use the tools available, but that doesn't mean that they're not problematic inherently. You do, Joe, yeah. um, I mean, I, I, uh, Don't agree I agree with me. Uh, <laughs> fundamentally, but I think one of the very interesting things about us as a society and how we're structured and why we, for example, celebrate the idea that you know, no one knows that you're a dog on the internet is because as a society, we're very used to this idea of being able to have very widely differing opinions and be able to debate those even violently. But when time comes to making decisions and taking concrete actions, we make those based on concrete information and data and they're being made um, with a considerable amount of, amount of thought. The difference with the megaphone that uh, is now provided is that a lot of people get judged and decisions get made in the court of public opinion as opposed to through any kind of formal process. And so until we're able to differentiate between decisions that get made in the court of public opinion and formal process and you know as a society learn to understand that these are different I think some, somehow we need to evolve to, to catch up to that I think our our norms are such that we're used to um, we're not used to having everything being decided in the court of public opinion we have a minute to for some questions no, so okay good well, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. That there, there's a kind of wistful longing. There's a golden age mythology that suffuses some of this conversation. There's a belief there was a time when everybody rode in the same direction. There was a deliberative democracy when people really th thought carefully, and, and, and I looking only at data rather than biases and preconceptions. I, don't, I think we have made manifest, thanks to the internet, many of the flaws in our political culture that have existed for a very long time. Anyway, that's my little two cents worth. We we tend to we we do demonize the media. I find, and when, when you know, as a journalist, let me just one point. I'm used to a time when you would break stories, and as it was the next morning, there would be a press conference, and the state attorney would get up and talk about an investigation, or the committee chair in the legislative uh, in the house would say we're going to have hearings, and you got traction. And that's how the system, political communication, worked in symbiosis with the political system. And now, you, it doesn't matter how outrageous the disclosures are in the press, there's a deafening silence coming from the political realm, which has become hijacked by a single party. So you have a, an emasculation of the system that you, is partly associated with the triumph of the internet, but it's really not the fault of the internet. And these other, and we, we want to you know, look at other form of causes of the dysfunction that we're in now. Anyway, so questions are before. Comments from you. Hi, this question is for Masyaj. Uh, you mentioned that you went around the country and you talked with 40 congressional candidates, which I think is fascinating. And I would right. love to hear what you learned. Um, I'm, I know you can only summarize it in like two minutes, but I would love to hear what you learned. Yeah, I, I don't want to steal time from my co-panelist. Very briefly, I want to hear it too. 
Um, these. <laughs> These are just regular people. It's, it's terrifying there. So a, a congressional campaign in particular is small. There's no professional IT staff except maybe, you know, some of the biggest names will probably have that. You're talking about three people who are operating out of the candidate's garage uh, later on out of a strip mall. Uh, there is, everybody's using personal devices. There is no guidance. This is the part that's scary to me. Is there's no guidance that comes from, since I worked with Democrats, the DCCC. You get a very thick, beautiful Belfer Center Harvard book that says, you know, if you are worried about a cyber incident, see your cybersecurity specialist, you know, things like that. <laughs> they refuse to name vendors. Uh, the, the part that scares me the most is that there's no place to go to for advice. Uh, people are told to be very careful and scared, but not given direction, particularly around uh, the just the mismatch I'll say is, is nobody among those campaigns understands that it is their personal accounts that are the politically dangerous ones. That if I want to mess with your campaign, I'm going to hack into your personal email and find drama. Either something real in there or something like Pizzagate where I can build a towering edifice. I think your slide showed wonderful examples of how you can take any raw material and turn it into a weapon. So, But people have no sense that that is where they are vulnerable. Nobody's helping them. When I go to a, a big name tech companies and plead with them, they refuse to like, I, I, I would plead, hey, can give us a phone number that we can give the campaign so they can call. Lawyers can't, FEC. So there is a vacuum of leadership in this space. That was the particularly distressing thing. Finding that out and finding out that congressional campaigns are human beings with, you know, that are not political professionals, just regular people, very scary. Can I be the lawyer just for a second on this? Which is one of the problems, and this is something that we could remedy, is that the campaign finance laws actually make it difficult for yes. the political parties to transfer that knowledge and resources to the candidate campaigns because these are in-kind contributions. So yes. those, the barriers that have been placed between the parties and the candidates are actually having this perverse effect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that's something that should be changed and probably everybody uh, in Congress would be in support of that. Right. And Congress passes laws to exempt itself from any security requirements, any sort of thing. The first thing they do is they, they exempt themselves. So one of my hopes was that some of these 40 campaigns will get elected and become the kind of the mole people who will introduce <laughs> things like U2F keys and security practices and training, the dreams. Uh, it's a question for Garija. The um, IRA strategies look more sophisticated than I had imagined, which makes me wonder that maybe the objectives were more sophisticated than we've thought of as well. I know it's beyond the empirical research, but if you could speculate a little bit about, you know, what were they seeking? Is it information gathering? Is it influence? Is there other things that could be components of what you'd be looking for with this kind of strategy? Um, my guess, to be honest, was they they started out saying, hey, how much attention can we get? And there was a lot of trial and error. And I think they started to realize that, oh, certain kinds of stories will get us eyeballs. And if we just try and push out, you know, political agenda, that's going to be sidelined. But I mean, so the period of time we were looking at was uh, early 2017 so this was a time where within the US there was a lot of uh, liberals who were you know very very activated very active on social media and it seemed like they were very much trying to take people in whatever direction they're already going and push them in that direction further so um, you know both, both in on on the on the left and the right, but I think it, there's there there was an effort to be comprehensive and not just political and kind of have a um I wouldn't I don't remember if it was Alex or someone else used this term sleeper cells hmm. of you know hey if we suddenly wanted to have a lot of people have a particular opinion about some event. Well, wouldn't it be great if we had a mailing list with, you know, millions of Americans that we could just send an email to? And it seemed like there was a strategic campaign to get that, to generate, for example, that, that mailing list. And you can see from the kinds of groups that they, I mean, this is just some examples, but their groups were all kinds of political interests, all different age groups, 
all different geographical regions. So I think they were just one objective is just to try and get attention from as many people as they can get and then use it when they need it in however however way. So they reverse engineered how it already works. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I mean, um, so my guess would be that it was there was like a, a large element of, of, of trial and error and figuring this out, but figuring out how to become an organic, how to become part of the organic uh, information ecosystem and then disrupt it. <laughs> Something you can do with that. Right? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Two-part question. First part for Garija, the second part for the whole panel. Um, so I was at Google in early 2017, and there were several grassroots groups who worked on fake news identification using all of Google's massive data stores. And there was a lot of pushback from leadership about how that should be used, a lot of pushback that fake news could even be objectively defined, yeah, a lot yeah, of, I yeah. think, not-so-good fake comparisons yeah. to mainstream media and the run-up to the Iraq war mm -hmm. and weapons of mass destruction, et cetera. So kind of two questions. One, how can we scope this problem in an objective way? And part two, I guess for the whole panel, how can we as tech workers or just as users of these products like convince these platforms to take their civic responsibilities like a little more seriously? Um, I think the question you're asking in terms of scoping the problem and trying to define fake news is um, the million dollar question. I know in our work it's something that we tried very hard to not answer because we didn't know how to answer it, particularly as a group of computer scientists uh, without any social sciences training. So we relied entirely on third party definitions. If a third party list, in particular in this case Wikipedia, labeled something as fake news, we adopted that. We didn't make any of these judgments. But um, especially looking at the sophistication of, for example, the IRA campaign, I think trying in any way to label something as black and white, fake or not fake, true or not true, is to me, I don't know that this is necessarily going to be a successful approach. I would be very wary to support any large technology group that says that they have an AI that can, they have a neural net that labels uh, uh, fake news. And so I think this is, a, this is a research area and a problem where we really need to have multi-party coming together. We need legal experts, we need social scientists, we need technologists to be able to combat this in an evolving way. I don't think this is something where we can say, okay, we solved it, done, next problem. Can I just add 10 seconds on this, which is that, and this is supported by your research, which is that the purely false stuff is not really the problem, yes. right? It's the, it's the pol if you look at what was put out there, it's the polarizing content. It's the kind of misleading, but not really false. And so th this is unfortunately, we're, we're talking about fake news because that's the, the language that's out there. But yeah. as you've shown and others have, it's like, you don't need to, you can do a lot with true or opinionated content. Most of, if you follow RT and Sputnik as I do or look at the Russian ads, most of it is either true or it's neither true nor false. It's or it's like, a question. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and, and so we don't really, we, we and, and this is a problem with the platforms too because they're, they're wrapped up in this, which is that they're going to focus on, oh, well, can't we figure out what truth is? But that's not really uh, the no. problem. I wanted to address the second part of your question, which is how do we actually get change to happen? It is important to follow the money in anything to do with the big tech companies. So one reason that they're so loath to do anything editorial, and Google, in fact, I, I, I heard them plead poverty, saying we can't possibly edit and curate. You know, we're only we have two people on this team. Uh, <laughs> but I think one source of this is the actual employees at these tech firms. And they've, had, they've been trying, but they've had trouble getting traction in getting internal change. We saw a little bit with Project Maven. That was this, kind of the first publicly visible success. I've been pushing really hard for people to try to defund the political action committees. We have situations with Facebook, for example, where Devin Nunes, who's on the Intelligence Committee, has paid uh, over $100,000 for Facebook ads. Facebook has made a direct political donation to his campaign of $5,000 in June. Uh, that's Facebook pack. That is, you know, and if you look at the people who are contributing to it through just payroll deduction, these are lefty NPR listeners. They're, so there's these points of 
opportunity where if we can get tech workers to kind of flex their muscles, maybe they can build their muscles a bit more and tackle bigger problems like how do we get a seat at the table when we make decisions about fake news and other topics that are suddenly more difficult. I just want to add one sort of modest dissent um, that it is possible that the most consequential dysfunction in our media system during the 2016 election had very little to do with new media. It had to do with massive failures by traditional media in the way they covered the campaign, the way they propelled the Trump candidacy by giving him nonstop airtime because he brought in large audiences. They conferred stature and centrality to his candidacy and a seriousness to his candidacy that the people doing that doubted themselves. They regarded him as a clown, but they played him as the emerging political figure. And then the press failed by giving outlandish, outrageous coverage to non-essential, trivial wrongdoing that was attributed to uh, Hillary and which succeeded in, in perpetuating the notion that she was a shadowy and sinister and untrustworthy person. So I think that it is possible that the things that we're re reacting to and that we're looking for solutions and ameliatives regarding new media were actually the fault of a massive press failure regarding traditional media, which in, in many respects failed in their job. So uh, let's not forget that with, with all this belief in a splintering of discourse and a splintering of the population, traditional media still are able to rivet the attention of large numbers of people and are able to continue directing us in a, in a way that's politically profoundly dysfunctional. Can I dissent from your dissent very quickly? Because <laughs> I we're at two, two levels of dissent down, which is good. Uh, the traditional media are dependent on the business model of chasing clicks and chasing attention. And I think that they were not able to adapt to that when you see the email coverage in particular. When every reporter and every editor can see exactly how much revenue came in from each article, it's a very, very dangerous dynamic. And I think you can safely blame tech for the business model side of that, even though it's the same players on the traditional media side. Um, mm. We uh, we have to wrap this session up so you have an opportunity for coffee. One of the most uh, to your question, though, one of the most interesting things I uncovered in trying to uh, educate myself for today was the specific role that the uh, uh, self organization on the part of printing press workers played in the politics of Russia uh, uh, in around 1905, um, around the same time that uh, censorship entered in Russia, which of course had all kinds of knock on effects in terms of transformation for that society, but the, it was the workers themselves who saw how mm. their work was being used by both sides uh, in the campaign who wanted some control over it. So that, that was actually very interesting in the light of your, of your comment. Okay. Uh, so if I could just thank the, the panelists. Yes, please, absolutely. So Nate, um, Mathieu, um, thank, you. thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>